welcome. Um, so I'll really try and be brief in our introductions. So again, this does not do justice to all of your work, but just to give people a taste of, of who we have collectively um, to talk about documenting heritage. So final panel for today, you'll all be sharing your own experiences, wisdom, lessons learned um, around how to keep bonds alive through art and design. So our moderator will be the wonderful Suparna Chadha, um, founder of the uh, Sibira Awards. I know you are a media entrepreneur who, you know, you touch multiple aspects of this topic. So really excited to have you here. So glad to be here, Eva. Thank you so much. I'm really, really very, very honored to be a part of this very eclectic group of uh, um, evolved women. Um, and wow. thank you, Eva, you're doing a fab job. I don't know if anybody's told you that. And that's what I was telling Ekta also. I'm sure you would have garnered a lot of accolades, but here's one more pat from me. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh I'm, a, I'm a learner this go round. Thank you so much, in front of that's super gracious. <laughs> um, incredible space to learn from you all. Um, well, yeah, so, so just to give a quick round, um, if not everyone knows everyone yet, um, Meher F. Hussein um, is joining us. Meher, I know you're a journalist and author. Um, you authored uh, Pakistan, A Fashionable History. So excited to have you um, join in. And Amna Sharif, um, really good to see you. Um, I know you're a jewelry designer and craft connoisseur. Um, your, your work is super inspired by your heritage. Um, and I'm sure we'll get to hear more about that. Uh, Ritu um, Kandaval, very good to have you. Uh, you're, I'm super curious to hear about your work also as an architect and a restorer of palaces. Um, and you know, you've learned so much about the challenge um, and what there is to be gained as we honor as we honor our past. Suparna Handa, um, very good to have you as well. Um, I know we'll get to hear more about your work as managing director of um, Sarita Handa um, and all of the home design that you bring in and, and the history that you draw from there. And then um, um, let's see, I'm making sure that people are live. Okay, good. I think, um, I think then Rina, um, last but not least, Rina Sanai Kalat, really good to have you. Please correct us if I mispronounced your name. <laughs> um, and you really bring in so, so many different aspects of art, sculpture, photography. Um, and I know you look a lot at borders and how they define people and how they're more fluid than we think, um, which is something that I remember Alice saying earlier as well. So. With that, we'll hand it over to you. Thank you again for taking extra time and just such a treat to be with you all. So thank you, thank you. Thank you so much, Eva, for that wonderful um, introduction. And, um, you know, there is um, something which has become a part of my engagement uh, publicly, considering that I am from the media industry uh, over the past 20 years. It's something that started in Islamabad in Pakistan. Um, and uh, it's an honor to do this right now also amidst all these wonderful women. An obeisance to the feminine energy, the goddess Saraswati. And I'll tell you what this means. It's, it's an ode to her. It's, uh, um, it's really praying to that energy to dispel the darkness of ignorance that clouds our hearts and our minds by the wisdom of knowledge. Ya kundendu tu chara hari dhavala, ya shubra vastravita, ya vuna vardanna manditakara, ya shweta padamasana, ya brahma chutta shankar prabhu jitri, devai sada vandita, samam patu saraswati, bhagvati nishesh jadyapa. A very old Sanskrit verse, very prevalent in regions where um, the feminine energy uh, is considered as divinity. Um, and the very first time I recited this was in a jam-packed hall in uh, Islamabad, interestingly. That's when um, I had the opportunity to curate the first ever South Asia Media Summit and probably the only one. 
and um, I forged such wonderful friendships uh, there, which continue um, to be existing today. And um, more importantly, it was such an eye opener because whenever we hear of the other side of the border, and I'm sure that's the case also with Pakistan, it's only through maybe the few books that you've read, at least at that point in time, 2013, there wasn't even these, uh, you know, Z hadn't, or Z5 hadn't been launched and we didn't have the serials and except for the age old series that we used to see. But um, it was, you know, a couple of books that you've read, um, the jaded literally media reports that are there, depending on what side of the border that you are. And when I landed in Islamabad, it was like an eye opener. It's such a beautiful city. It's a new city. It's state of the art. Uh, the people that I interacted with, just like us. I mean, I, um, my parents, of course, came in from Lahore and Rawalpindi through the, uh, through the partition. And I had always, uh, you know, envisaged Pakistan through their eyes and their childhood. And then, of course, with the kind of media reportage that we were getting. And uh, the media reportage did not do justice at all to what I actually um, saw there. I mean, uh, maybe it was um, not the entire country, but whatever exposure that I did get, um, it was beautiful. And, and the Pakistani people welcomed us with open arms. Wherever we would go, I still get goosebumps and a lump in my throat when I share this. There was so much love. There was so much acceptance. They wanted to know more about us as do we want to know more about you. And I'm glad that we're doing this. Um, in fact, COVID has probably opened up the borders much more than what physically um, uh, we are, you know, kind of used to. So um, this, this summit itself, getting, you know, women from both sides of the border, speaking to each other, connecting to each other. And like I said, I forged uh, friendships in Pakistan. And um, one of them was with the Sharif sisters. And Amna is here with us. Amna, you're here, right? We let's start with you itself. I think you have an amazing story to tell. You um, have lived in India, this part, for almost, what, two years. And um, um, your designs as a jewelry designer um, have been carried in Fab India and Ogan, and that's a big deal. <laughs> so tell me, what is your first impression or was your first impression of India? And when you came across and stayed here, how did that change or evolve? So the first feeling that I got when I was in India on my first visit, basically, was of being really, really comfortable. Comfortable also because we all look the same. We speak the same language. We eat the same food. And yet I'm anonymous and nobody knows me. So it was like a sense of immense freedom for me to be who I am with no, no one looking at me, no, nobody knows me, and yet I'm part of the whole city or the country. So that was quite amazing, that feeling. So how did you come uh, to be staying here? What, tell us your story. Well, my story starts from when I was a journalist and my first visit to India was to attend a conference in, that was in Bangalore. That was many, many years ago. I think it was 1999. And made some journalist friends there. And then, uh, so my first career was as a journalist. Then I started an art, art and craft gallery in Lahore. Um, after that, I realized, no, it has to be something more creative. So I went to London. I learned to make jewelry and came back and started practicing and making my designing and making my own jewelry. So this was in 2007 that I got um, a fellowship. Uh, it was an Asian fellowship foundation and where I applied and I got, I won a, so my 
I had the option of going anywhere in Asia for a research project. And I chose to go to India, obviously, and, uh, and to study the revival of craft in India. And of course, the so, uh, special focus was on jewelry and the revival of jewelry in India after, after the long era of colonialism. And we know how the craftsmen had suffered through the colonial era where they were, they, was, they were not encouraged at all. And I could see the picture in Pakistan. So I wanted to know how India came about doing that. So that took me to Delhi and I was there for um, six, about six months and, and gave me the opportunity to travel all over India as well. So from Delhi and of course, Jaipur and um, Bombay, Kutch, Hyderabad, Chennai, Calcutta. So many, many stories, many interactions with made long lasting friendships and uh, with all sorts of people from carigars to craftsmen to, to fellow designers, to journalists, to all sorts of people. And yeah. So, uh, Amna, tell me how much of your um, creations today reflect um, uh, reflect um, the arts or the crafts from our shared past? Does it at all or is it more contemporary? What is the kind of work that you're doing now? So my work also kind of changed a little bit after my stint in India, where I realized the importance of tradition. Uh, my work is basically based in tradition, but it's not soulless. It is not uh, stagnant or tired looking either. So it's traditional, but for our contemporary times for, for women of today. In fact, I'm a proud owner of one of Amna Sharif's creations. I've, I wear this, that silver earring that you gifted to me and I, it's, yeah. it's a very precious possession of mine. Thank you, Amna. Thank you, yeah. Okay, at this point, I want to get um, Meher into the conversation. Hi, Meher. Good to see you. And so wonderful to read about the work that you've been doing. You've, uh, you've worked with the uh, Pakistani fashion industry. Um, yes, yes, I have indeed. And you've, uh, you've written about it. And, um, I have, yes. and an Indian designer, Yani, has written a foreword to one of your books. And, um, Absolutely. and it, it, it's been a very interesting quest also for you to find uh, the identity or individuality of Pakistani fashion, so to speak. You want to share some? Uh... Absolutely. You know, what's interesting is that um, I spent my ch part of my childhood in Saudi Arabia. And at that point, you know, there was never any form of identity in the sense that I am a Pakistani. And I think the first awareness of being a Pakistani actually came about when I was visiting, we had actually moved to Pakistan in, when I turned seven. And we were sort of flitting back and forth between Pakistan and Saudi Arabia. And I remember it was a World Cup cricket and it was Pakistan versus England. And we, I was standing in school and somebody came to me and they said, okay, who are you supporting? And prior to living in Saudi Arabia, we'd been living in Britain. So it just came very naturally to me. I said, oh, I'm supporting England. And they said, why? Aren't you a Pakistani? And that was the first time when it hit me that, okay, all right. I think I can get used to this. This is, this is something new. That was the first awareness of being a Pakistani. Hmm. And, you know, so right now what's interesting is that over the years, my own identity as a woman, as a Pakistani, it has evolved and it has changed significantly in relation to the type of work that I've done. Um, whether it was as a journalist, whether it was visiting India, whether it was working with Indian fashion designers or Pakistani fashion designers, whether it was even writing about heritage sites in Pakistan and even writing this fashion book. Over time, I've seen that you know, identity is such a fluid concept. 
I think it's very limiting if you just stick to one thing on the basis of geography and, and, and define your world according to that. I fail to understand what this is going to achieve. I fail to accept that, that notion that if you are in the world, you are the only one. That can't be possible. That simply can't be possible. I'd like to show you something very quickly. This is one of the books that I had worked on. Um, I had edited it. Um, it's called Multan, A Spiritual Legacy. Now, what I want to show you very quickly is that Multan is one of the oldest cities in the world. Now, for me, while I was working on this book, it was a realization that how can I deny the Hindu, the Sikh heritage when it's there, right next to my maternal shrine, right next to the saints that we have, how can I deny it? It's part of my heritage. It's there. It's, it's, it can't be forgotten. Another example is um, my father's shrine, which is in Jhang. Jhang at the time of partition, Suparna, was majority Hindu because our patron saint did not believe, despite being sent by the Mughal Emperor Shah Alam to encourage conversion, he refused to do it. Instead, there was this philosophy of coexistence. Right. And at the time of partition, it was a Hindu majority area. Again, when I go to my father's shrine as well, and I look at the lands, and I look at the area around it, there's this sense of sorrow, ki kya tha aur kya ho gaya hai. Because today, Jhang is, you know, it's a sectarian hotbed, unfortunately. Similarly, when I visited India, upon my return, a lot of friends asked that, you know, what was it like? What was it like? And I kept sitting there thinking, I could do the holiday now. And they said, but you just went on holiday. I said, no, I actually went home. It was just like going home. There was no difference. Literally getting onto a flight, landing at Delhi airport and stepping out. It was like, yeah, ye to ap ap hai, ye ke, you know, it was, it was nothing different at all. I just thought, well, this is, I think one of the strangest trips I've ever been on because I've traveled, but I've arrived home as well. And now when I work in craft, one of the things that strikes me most is how our craft is the same. Whether I go to um, South Punjab, where you have women, craft women, rural women, who I think are just, they are my heroes in life, whether it's on either side of the border. I think the South Asian rural woman is possibly, you can't understand her, you can't, you can't categorize her. She, she transcends all definitions, everything. And I see the craft work, whether it's in South Punjab, where gota, mukesh, embroidery, the patterns, um, the designs. And then I think back of when I went to Jaipur and I saw the same things happening, whether it was a fancy mall in Delhi or whether it was Jaipur ka Andrun Sheh, wohi cheez hai. Gota, Mukesh, Bele, Ambli, Chidiya, Pool, it's exactly the same thing. Ji. What has happened, Suparna, is perhaps the aesthetic is different. So in, in India, you might see the same craft being applied in a different way, wherein it is in, in Pakistan, it's about the fabric. Because whenever we've had Indian friends come over, they, 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 you know, they look at the craft and think, this is hobby, hai, but they like the fabric. So what baffles me consistently is why can't the two meet? You have the Indian aesthetic and you have Pakistani fabric. Why can't they just merge together as they have for centuries? As they have for centuries. I mean, I just want to read the first line that Tarun Tiliani wrote for my book. He said, this is the very first line. He opens it with this. He goes, being Sindhi myself, I mean, just the first thing is being Sindhi and myself, immediately there's this connection of two countries coming together on the basis of identity that has not been defined by anything. What, what strikes me consistently, and this is something that again, I have, I fail to understand why people can't see this. You have politics on one side, take it. But on the other hand, you have, art, literature, music, poetry, craft, clothing, fabric, patterns, and you're letting that one thing supersede everything else. I mean, yeah, I, ke mean pe bhi 
चांद के मुंह पे भी दाग है लेकिन चांद ने कभी ये तो नहीं कहा ना कि क्योंकि दाग है आज रात को मैं नहीं आऊंगा फिर भी रोशनी भी तो आती है ना <laughs> रोशनी तो आ रही है अंधेर दिखाने में से सो आई फेल टू अंडरस्टैंड व्हाई वी कांट हैव मोर ऑफ दीस थिंग्स दैट एक्चुअली इन का एंड इन दिस डिजिटल एज यू नो वो 80s 90s का रीजन तो नहीं रहा ना जहां पे आपको फिजिकली जाना पड़ता था एज आमना सेड यू हैड टू गो अक्रॉस यू हैड टू फोर्ज relationships i mean in this digital age with with instagram um with twitter with facebook with so many things happening so much can be done um and to look at what it has happened today there's nothing to be happy about um as a publisher it is also like a double edged sword it has forged relationships and it has also destroyed Agreed. a lot of it <laughs> agreed but superna this is the thing we belong in a region which is one of the oldest south asia one of the oldest civilizations on this planet and i find it very sad to see that our senses have been dulled down to the point where whatever we see whatever we read whatever we hear defines our thought process yes i mean come back yeah. we need we need to look deeper we need to look within come to know more about your work and i'll come back to you but i'll get sarita um uh, suparna from sarita handa uh, creations into the conversation and what are the odds of having two suparnas on a panel and interestingly also both our mother's name is also sarita that's also <laughs> yes i read that i was quite amazed suparna i have to say i haven't met too many suparnas i haven't met too many sarita so i was like oh my god this is <laughs> it was meant to be i was meant to be on this right. picking up on what meher was talking about in terms of shared art and how the motives have actually uh you know are very similar but how they're executed is different so from your perspective uh, you know running the sarita handa uh, outfit how have you or have you uh, contextualized or contemporized those designs Uh, and made them uh, aspirational uh, you know because you are a luxury house right so to right. to inculcate that and make that aspirational share some of that with us please actually uh, you know before starting off on that i have to say that uh, may i have to listen to you and you know you said this thing about the indian aesthetic in the pakistani fabric and um, i will talk about the craft and the shared uh, heritage um, the shared crafts but i think one thing i will say is that i think that trade has its own importance and i i think uh, you know uh, while i have the creative bent of mind i do also am a very strong like the business comes uh, is a very strong for part of who i am and uh, i think that's where trade fosters because uh, irrespective of political ideologies or what's happening in the subcontinent it's interesting that we do business out of china we do business out of pakistan and we do business out of india and irrespective of what's going on on ground um, as a business you're always thinking of how to collaborate and how to bring um, and at that point boundaries don't come in and i've always found that fascinating um, and you know to talk about the crafts and how we bring them forward first of all uh, suparna there's just so much heritage and uh, interestingly i was looking at the maps and i was looking at the shared craft so whether you talk about fulkari or you talk about the cruel work um chicken shadow work i mean there's just it almost feels to me seamless uh, i don't think of it as two countries uh, but i think what's interesting is to keep it alive by making it uh, i think uh, uh, amna mentioned about it being contemporary and it's how do you make it relevant so is it in the colors is it uh, so you take a fulkari and it's usually in very bright colors how do you yeah. make that in relevant it uh, relevant to today's consumer um yeah. and i think uh, uh, that's where people like us come in uh, the fashion world comes in and absolutely uh, the, absolutely right. super you're right because i remember um sayer segal was one of the first to take the sanganari flower and merge right, yeah. it with pakistani fabric here and back in the 80s when she started she was getting chicken made from lucknow on pakistani fabric and then exporting it abroad to her shop in 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 london it's it, like you said the, the the trade is there all of it is there the craft as it very correctly said how do you make it more modern tradition to hai right. 
how do you make it more relative in this new relevant, world? That's right. Yeah, so I, I think that's where, uh, you know, and I, and I think that's the responsibility that each one of us has, because when it comes down to trade and when it comes to, uh, and, and, you know, I know this is about women and how they promote peace, but I think a big part of it is through fashion. It is about, uh, and when I use fashion, I don't mean it in a frivolous way. I mean it in a very uh, real way in terms of keeping the art alive. Uh, it's people like us that really keep the crafts alive. Uh, and I think that's the responsibility that we have irrespective of whether you're a luxury house, you're a commercial space, uh, and to recognize the shared heritage that we all have. Sure. I absolutely uh, agree with you. I mean, who can forget when Tarun Talyani came to Pakistan to showcase his fashion show and there were literally people watching it and going, chicken to hamari jaisi hai. You know, it, it was like, well, actually, if you look at the use of it, but when it comes down to the basic craft, the groundwork, you know, gloss but when it comes down to the essence of it, like you very correctly said, there's definitely a shared handicraft. I mean, I see it in the block printing that I do on Instagram, on, on people that I'm exchanging ideas with across the border. It's the same blocks, it's the same technique, it's the same patterns. I really don't see any difference. But now, yeah, what, what Meher is saying, does that also find a semblance in the work that you're doing? So, Subhana, so I will say that we are always uh, looking back into history. We're always looking back into the crafts. Uh, every season, uh, I mean, embroideries is a big part of what Sarita Handa does. And every season we go back into the archives to say, how do we look at something differently? So the techniques really remain age old. There's no difference. Um, I think the difference will be in the coloration, how you use it. Uh, do you scale it up? Do you uh, keep it, you know, uh, small scale? That's the only difference, but it's always going back, at least for us, I have to be honest, it's always going back into age old techniques and making them relevant today. And all that changes is Absolutely. color, I would say, and scale. Sarita Handa, uh, uh, as a luxury house, is doing very well, goes to show that there is a market for it, right? People are looking at that age-old uh, tradition and, con you know, in a more contemporary setup and to get that back home. And, I mean, mashallah, I think Meher is also doing wonderfully. So I guess we all are probably um, linking our pasts and creating something new, which is the evolution of culture as well. Thank you, Saparna. Uh, I want Thank to, you so much. I, I want to also get now um, Ritu into the conversation. And um, uh, Ritu has been, um, um, you know, kind of preserving our heritage more to speak from an architectural perspective. And I want to bring her into the conversation and ask her what her experience has been. And first, of course, to share some of um, uh, the work that she's been doing. Ritu? Yeah. Hi. So uh, I, I, I come from Jaipur and uh, I'm now 25 years into this practice. Me and my husband run, run a brand called Stapatya Architects. And uh, so the initial 10 years, frankly, of the practice was just finding the way forward. You know, honestly, first 10 years, I don't remember even thinking about heritage or thinking about, you know, how to preserve it. In fact, the whole world was running after luxury. There was a lot of money flow in the market. And that was where we were thrown in. Uh, then we happened to get a project, uh, uh, old fort on Delhi Jaipur Highway. And uh, it was uh, a fort, you know, which was uh, like in, inhabited by bats and monkeys and it was a very bad state. And we were asked to make an adaptive reuse of the project. That's where my heritage journey started. You know, it was almost in 2008, as late as that that uh, you know my heritage journey started and when we plunged into that project we then began the whole heritage i mean uh, richness of the country and of cultures you know started to dawn upon us and then i sort of got into deeply understanding how what is it that we called her heritage 
what is it that we need to preserve why do we need to preserve it at all what is it is it just like a beautiful motif that we want to recreate or is there more to it so what i have understood out of heritage so why i am talking about this is that heritage doesn't have boundaries you know there are no boundaries absolutely heritage is reflection of the culture of people in place and time whatever was developed what we are talking today what you will be making today the techniques the innovations what i will be making today 10 100 years hence that will be heritage so we are also creating heritage while we are looking at the past and the wisdom of the past so in this experience we developed a property and then we did multiple forts and multiple heritage conservation projects and adaptive reuse projects uh, wherein we tried to establish uh preserve what was there and make it contextual in today's time what i mean the fashion industry is also doing but in that we uh, you know looked at the culture and the craft of the people around and really got involved with people you know so heritage is a lot about people people around where you are working your senses for example i'll give you a very simple example that uh, we had to put marble in the property and i had to select a marble as to what marble to be put and so i had the whole world open to me i could have put anything that looks good however there were some old uh, pillars remaining the whole thing was damaged but just a few old pillars which had a gray on the area belt marble i went hunting for that marble located a mines which resembled that marble and trust me in those 10 years of that restoration of that project i would have visited at least 50 times the mines which takes one full day to go and go and select a block get it cut and put it on site that is the kind of effort you have to do to retain that one or two pillars they could have just gone but you know so that exposed us to the local material then there were there were artisans there were basic masons and carriers from around that area now you know we are used to very high finished product and everything very meticulous and you know it should look good and it should be luxurious but that's not the point the imperfection sometimes is what you look for because imperfections is about people and you know we chose imperfection we chose people from the local area trained them worked with them made them understand the modern need made them understand the modern you know uh, need of the hour how you know people respond to and they learned mm. so my experience with heritage is very very different you know we i have modernized the usage we've put air conditions not that you know they they are all hidden you can't see because that's who we are today so so you can't work on dead heritage you have to make it live and contextual to today's times oh. and then about you know pakistan so since we are in a peace summit i, I would like to say that what shila said just in the talk before it really touched my heart that it's all about the energy the, you know the underlying energy all of us are working upon so if the, it's you know say if you talk of pottery why only talk of uh, india and pakistan you know the pottery of europe and the pottery of china like everywhere pottery is the same but the artwork is the reflection of their culture whatever they are living whatever their aspirations are each culture has a different aspiration so um you know i think that sensitivity and that positivity that we need to have of the other like the like we are talking about what they do and what we do it's not about what they do it's just about mankind about various cultures and respecting this difference also so i had a feeling about see the whole india pakistan issue always that you know there are siblings out of the same mother and they tread their own path and they make their own identity somebody becomes a writer somebody becomes a designer somebody becomes a scientist you know they they just branch out but when there is uh, you know they have to share sorrow they come back to their home 
or if they have to share some joy or they celebrate a festival they come back to their own it's mm-hmm. just like that i feel the whole indian subcontinent sri lanka pakistan bangladesh all of us are just like that we are from the same mother and we're just okay. finding our own identity everybody is finding their own and we have to respect fully this difference and celebrate this difference that is there and the commonality that we have you know this border is really only only and only political <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely and totally it's just agree. it's totally so agree it's with you totally that and what happens is another thing is like all, a lot of journalists are there i really want to express this to all journalists that a mm. non biased journalism is what people like us you know simple common people need for us yeah. to develop the empathy and for us to develop the connection with the other you know because yeah. all of us when you talk of the roots when you watch some movies which shows the pain of partition or when you hear stories from your elders it's horrifying i don't think yeah. anybody approves yeah. of that it's yeah. only yeah. so so more than us more than the arts and so today if i i really don't have any access to artisans from pakistan or i don't have any access to you know people if i can i want to get some people from there to work for our tangible heritage we can't mm-hmm. how do we get them how do we reach out to them yeah. so whatever we may do whatever we may but there has to be like a change physically to it's it's an opportune time to uh, get ready yes. for the conversation uh, we've yes. spoken about borders we've spoken about the imaginary lines and how uh, while political borders may have a very solid foundation so to speak but it can't cut through hearts it can't cut through cult- cultures uh, everything else supersedes it everything yeah. else should supersede it and, and if Renata you are to actually you know, done a very interesting thing she's taken the pain of partition or uh, you know the negative aspect of those borders and created something very beautiful out of that rene we would love to know about um the work that you're doing um working around borders so to speak nice oh such a amazing uh, panel and to to hear all these amazing women that's been re- hugely inspiring i think i mean part of what i think each of us have been saying and you know we resonate with each other about how we need more and more of these platforms to uh, have these exchanges across borders i mean we know our border is merely a political construct i mean we are looking at uh, this kind of you know rapid communalization of politics the commercialization of the media space and and i think really these kind of exchanges which are a real people to people um, you know which have salvaged um, and and sort of taken us to a time when we we all spoken of our shared histories and these long civilizational links and a lot of my work does draw from that and uh, i mean i've worked as an artist for over now 20 25 years and uh, my work has of course been shown across the world and yet um i think i mean my growing years in in mumbai where i live uh, was very much you know in a cosmopolitan environment and one never even thought about uh, you know it was again this sort of fluid mix of going between homes in a, in a way sort of suburban mumbai you actually uh, could just walk into different people's homes the kind of diversity of various religions and languages and so on and it was only much later that i had to think back of the kind of fissures that partition had created in the kind of you know fracture and disjuncture from our long traditions and of course growing up i had um, you know listened to stories about my father being from La- being born in lahore and you know like many others who spoke about their family histories and how they had to move i mean his eldest brother had to move 
during partition and leaving everything behind and what that really meant and the impact of that was only uh, i think i only began to recognize that much later you know in the early 2000s uh, if i'm able to share screen now i can take you through some of the work because i think i took the liberty to insert some of the works as we were talking because there's just um, a lot of what was spoken is so integral to my work and so I'll probably just uh, quickly share screen and I mean, if I'll just take you through some of the early, like the early 2000 when I was flying across the line of control and, and it was such a chilling moment to think of the sort of incision on the land and um, this kind of uh, wound almost, I mean, I, you know, you think of the border lit here, but cutting across territory and I sort of really worked around thinking of how these have shaped geographies over time and uh, very quickly we'll run through some of the works that have been shown in, in various institutions whether it's thinking of the form of the disputed territory and and uh, the sort of uh, the gates that are at the Vaga Atari border there, I began to really combine one half from each side of the border to form this entity that is, again, we spoke of the syncretism of cultures and, and how they're so deeply enmeshed and uh, our ties and our deep rootedness. I mean, while these are one half of each gate formed, it's a sculpture that I made in, in the early 2000s. And, and um, you know, this sort of sacred thread is again part of rituals in both Hindu temples and in mosques where it's meant to be untied when wishes are fulfilled and here it sort of forms roots, not only debarring entry exit, but also um, alluding to these long shared civilizational histories that are so deeply rooted. And uh, Two Degrees was again a piece that I did, which was again thinking of around the river Indus and its multiple tributaries where Ravi beads, Satlaj flow into India, Jhelum, Chenab and the river Indus into Pakistan. And while the river may have multiple names, essentially the waters being the same. And a lot of the work really I've been thinking of how uh, you know, these transboundary agreements that often result in the partitioning of the rivers can also be ways of our collaborations of coming together to, to look at natural resources, whether they're land, rivers, to uh, try and bridge these um, um, ties to, to sort of look at how we might conserve these. I mean, again, it's this sort of terracotta pottery, but I won't hold, stay long with these because I know we have quickly to run through them just to give you a sense of the, the trees where one half grows into the banyan, the other into the devdar trees as the two trees that stem out of the same roots. And they're both national trees of India and Pakistan. I mean, this was a piece that I showed at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, which was, uh, a work called Woven Chronicles and it's a piece that I've you know shown several iterations of in Canada and various other places but it's again tracing the movement of migrants historically and and looking at how we blur these lines across geographies through trade technology commerce and uh, there's a sound component of factory sirens ship horns communication tones deep sea drone sounds so to think of the highly connected world we live in through um, <clears throat> the fiber optic cables that run under the seas and yet we still seem to be holding on to these uh, conservative ways of thinking and and this is a whole range of uh, an imaginary species of birds, animals, trees that are actually formed by one half coming from each side. So whether you have the national symbols from India and Pakistan forming, say, this is of course from Bangladesh, the, pe the PL as the peacock and the doyal as these birds that come together or the lomine as the lotus and the, the jasmine from Pakistan as the cross between the two flowers or, or the, the animals, the tikhor as a cross between the tiger and the, the markhor, both national animals of India and Pakistan. A range of sculptures that I made that actually take off from devices that were built during the world wars to try and track sounds of enemy aircrafts. And I make these um, 
to subvert those notions of war by actually having bird sounds of these countries across borders that you actually step into and you listen to these bird calls. I mean, we again spoke of how we need to tune into signals from nature to, to try and uh, look at how we go ahead uh, in the future. So, so many of these were shown at the Manchester Museum and uh, I'm currently showing works at, uh, or, or this I just put in when we were talking about um, the various lenses and I was thinking about a lot of the work that I've made about these kinds of colored visions that we have where we're all holding on to our own partial truths and our own realities. But memory being such a complex set of interactions between seeing, remembering, imagining, and, and that space, you know, these liminal spaces between uh, one side and the other, and how are we going to be uh, communicators that can see both sides and and in this, this work, which is called Blind Spots, it really takes off from the idea of the physiological blind spot where we are uh, unable to bridge that gap of being able to see uh, certain things that go beyond our vision. And it's really the coming together of preambles of both constitutions from countries in conflict that are played out through these, it's a sound piece and, eye charts of, you know, it's a kind of vision test. So people step into them and they're reading one alphabet at a time. It's a kind of fragmented recital of the preamble where they're only seeing one, one part of the whole. And they're sort of holding on to that one part and not realizing and recognizing uh, all our own prejudices, our own limitations in being able to understand other realities. And so these morph into Braille. So all the common shared values that are part of both con constitutions. And I often think of how we're, our aspirations are the same of peace, equality, justice. And today more than ever, we're realizing that, you know, um, democracies all over the world are under strain and, and um, so yeah, this is the last work I leave you with, which is again about the, you know these paired constitutions from different countries. This is part of my solo, which is currently up at the Guimet Museum in, in Paris, which is having to go through lockdown. But again, these are constitutions that are made where the text is made uh, through the process of time die, an art that only perhaps exists in both border sharing countries of Kutch and Karachi. And I've sort of worked with these craftspeople over the years to make the tie and eye where each dot is drawn, tied, and then uh, reveals the, the text. And, and here again, all the common shared values uh, morph into Braille. But I actually began working with tie and eye. I mean, when we spoke about women and, and how, um, the, the way that I arrived at this, so this is the sort of in-between space, um, you know, so they are constitutions of say India, Pakistan, Serbia, Croatia, there's Sudan, South Sudan, there's US, Mexico, there's US, Cuba, and so on in as part of these constitutions. But I was just saying that how I arrived at using Braille was also from my very early childhood experience of having lost my mother when I was really young. And as a little girl, the only way that I uh, began to understand her was through all the things she left behind amongst these closed wardrobes uh, that, you know, all her personal belongings uh, lied in there were her saris and amongst which were also her handwritten recipe books. So I sort of built a relationship around all the belongings she left behind. And I secretly would bring out her saris and put them back. And at one point I decided to, you know, having come full circle with my own experience with motherhood, I went back to my early childhood years. And so much of motherhood is about nurturing, nourishing, that I decided to make translations from her handwritten recipe books into Braille. And uh, I felt that 
the work would not communicate to either the those sighted or the blind because it would be inaccessible and i wanted the viewer to to feel that sense of inaccessibility of illegibility of the text much like my own experience which was built through inscrutable fragments of memory and i think this this sense of loss of a place of the sense of dislocation is so integral to experiences around partition and how we grasp with these realities of having left a home behind and having left um, yeah so i think i just leave you with this last work rina that's amazing we've been getting a lot of comments complimenting you on your work and what is also uh, important which stands out is that you know in a cognitive way you're trying to associate uh, creativity and art and pleasantness on what was evoking a lot of maybe animosity or hatred uh, in the past so that's a, a very very important uh, line that you are drawing so to speak quite literally i want to also get into the conversation i know we're running very very late masuma she has a very interesting story to share she is an artist that has traveled across uh, south asia extensively and um uh, we'd love to hear more about uh, her from her own self masuma well my connection my uh, my relation with india is now uh, almost more than 15 years old uh, it's not just the marriage there it's also i have lots of friends there now and uh, going there and coming back and forth it's been a long journey uh which started in 2003 when i was first time invited by coach this artist collective in based in delhi so i was somehow part of all these uh, networks and uh, my first uh, visit to india was in 2003 and that was the time i think a lot of things were happening a lot of um, collaborations among artists and shows um and books even were uh, getting written by uh people like selima hashmi and um, uh, yashoda dalmia so uh, everything was open the borders were open um physical space was accessible um devi foundation anupam podar uh, who was running this private museum he started this museum he was also coming uh, very often to pakistan and meeting artists in their studios so i think everything was uh, blooming that time and the time was from 2003 to 2012 i would say um and that was the time when i also um, got settled in india before i moved to india uh, first i moved to nepal and i prefer to stay outside this region because i'm also coming from army background my father was in army just like um, amina uh, and it was not easy for me to uh, make this decision to move to india straight away so um, i think it was first to nepal where i stayed for a year and then gradually gradually i had to to just convince everyone around and i made this choice and i moved there finally in 2008 you know it's a, it's so abstract it's so complicated it's um, it's beautiful uh it's um it's difficult um it's not easy to even talk about because my own work is um it's about human relations emotions um intuitively developed and um, it lies in the complexity of uh, of uh, human life also so um which is which is amazing which is beautiful which is very delicate but uh, when it comes to ground reality things are not so much in black and white um things are not so rosy at all because uh, we can't bypass politics we can't bypass um, other uh, bureaucratic procedures especially when it comes to uh, borders and the hostility of diplomacies so everything um, everything else uh, goes on uh, goes on uh, dreams goes on 
and uh, plans also, aspirations also, relations also. But um, day to day life definitely it uh, it affects when it comes to individuals, and especially after getting married. What I realized because I've been going to this, these visa offices and immigration processes in India, but also in Pakistan, and. Uh, what I experienced was the life of the people who are not so privileged, uh, who has gone through uh, this for a long time. And, you know, uh, like in my case, I would say, or artists or writers or people who uh, can pull the strings here and there and can get things done is very different. But uh, the day-to-day -day life for the people who um, uncles and aunts and sisters, they were across the border for years. And uh, I was very closely, you know, uh, becoming part of their life as well, while going through the same procedures. So for me, it was not, it was not that easy. For me, I always looked at as long partition. Or for me, partition happened when I landed in India. Because um, uh, my family history was very different. They were they they never came from India. They had no strings attached to India. They were Punjabis, always living in Lahore and different parts of Punjab. So for them, India was a totally different story. Uh, I started it. So everything that started from me, and uh, so. Uh, and it's still on. I mean, I uh, it's it's never ending. It's a um, um, it's a place which is. Uh, uh, I mean, it's it's very close, but at the same time, it's very distant. Uh, um, and that's uh, that's the sore part of the love story, also, because the these all these things which we think we can easily bypass, I don't think so. You know, uh, whatever art we make, whatever books we write, whatever forums uh, we attend, I am also part, part of uh, some uh, different virtual forums during COVID because uh, I'm also teaching art. You're literally a real life Veer Zara story, is it? I'm sure you've heard, you heard it many times before. <laughs> you know this is Bollywood but life is not like Bollywood you know this reduce it to only you know this very Bollywood uh, caricature of uh, the present life so when it comes to real ground reality is marriage in any way it's a very complicated area. and when it's and when it's between Pakistan and India then it's more complicated it's not that easy it's um, it's not that easy. It's very difficult, and it's um, and it's beautiful. I mean, it's uh, it's uh, there's a attraction always for the for the other. The curiosity is there about the other. Yeah. Yes, Masuma, we hear you. It's not an easy thing when you try to do something like this. Even when Ekta is trying to do something like this, there are there is dissent. There are people who would want something like this not to happen, but you know, it's the will and the love um, uh, that makes it happen. But on a personal note, yes, I understand. It, it, it must be an extremely uh, challenging um, thing for you to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. I hear you and um, empathize with you as well, Masuma. But wish you all the best. And I guess we'll have to wrap this up right now as much as we'd want to continue with this. But thank you so much, Amna. Meher, Masuma, Reena, Ritu, and my namesake, Suparna. Um, I wish you all a beautiful and a fulfilling year ahead. And I hope there's going to be um, a second edition of the Indo-Pak Peace Summit organized by Ishi um, in uh, 2022. <laughs>